So welcome to um, session 3A on sustainability. I'm super excited to, to have this session. Uh, sustainability is a grand challenge for, for our society, for our generation. And I'm, I'm super happy to see the first session on sustainability in the computer architecture conference. Uh, I'm sure there will be more to follow. Uh, so let's, let's get started. So the first paper will be presented by Jennifer Switzer. Um, Jennifer is a third year PhD student at UC San Diego and her research interests are in reducing uh, carbon footprint of computing via a lifetime extension and repurposing. So Jennifer, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some of our recent work in repurposing discarded smartphones as carbon efficient computing systems. So as we get started, I'd like to ask you all to take a moment to think about how many smartphones you've had in your life so far. So up until about a week ago, I could say that I had gotten rid of six phones in my life. However, I then smashed my current phone. So I had to change these slides to say that I've gotten rid of seven phones in 13 years. In America, we get rid of about 150 million phones each year. In either case, this works out to an about two year lifespan per device. So this is pretty short. And this is also unfortunate given, that, given the fact that when I and other consumers discard our smartphones, they are generally speaking still fully or mostly functional. There might be some cosmetic damages or maybe the consumer wants an upgrade, but for the most part, the phone still works as a phone. As a direct consequence of these short lifespans, as well as the low operational power of a smartphone, the majority of carbon emissions associated with our smartphone use come not from use, but rather manufacturing, about 80% for Google, Apple, and other manufacturers. So if we care about reducing the carbon footprint of our smartphone use, we need to look at extending lifetimes and therefore eventually manufacturing less. Of course, this is easier said than done because lifetime extension is difficult, consumers want new phones, the refurbishing market for smartphones is also extremely limited. Only phones from the last two or three years are actually financially viable to refurbish and resell. Furthermore, you might think that e-waste recycling is a good alternative. However, unfortunately, the state of e-waste recycling today is that it's energy intensive, hazardous, it's oftentimes done in unlicensed facilities, and even when done properly, can at most recover the raw materials that went into a device's construction, which is responsible for a small fraction of that carbon footprint. So for this project, we take a different perspective and we look at lifetime extension through repurposing. So asking ourselves, what else can a phone be other than the obvious? And we observe that phones are after all, nothing more than small computers with some added peripherals. They already give us a lot without us having to do anything. They have several processors, including in more recent devices, specialized accelerators. They have networking capabilities for Wi-Fi and cellular. They have backup power via batteries. They also do an interesting thing called thermal throttling, whereas the device gets too warm, it will throttle its CPU to avoid burning the user, which is, a good, which is good news for us if we're thinking about packing a lot of phones into a small space. Of course, there are also associated challenges. So notably, phones are, of course, relatively weak. We calculate that one server is approximately equivalent to 50 smartphones, so we need a way to aggregate these relatively small devices. Furthermore, the mobile software stack assumes human input. Your phone is not meant to be always on and autonomous. And most notably, mobile OSs will kill or throttle long running processes to save battery. So yeah, phones are computers, but they're small specialized computers and they were never meant for what we're trying to do with them here. So nevertheless, our goal is to go from small clusters of smartphones, maybe on the order of 10, since we said 50 phones as a server, combined with some added hardware peripherals to provide networking, power and cooling, as well as an updated software stack to deal with those OS related issues and manage a larger number of devices. With these three components, we hope to get something that looks like an always on server made from smartphones. So success for this project has two metrics. First, we want our smartphone based system to be performant enough for some subset of applications. And we want to make sure that we're meeting our sustainability targets by ensuring that the smartphone based system is more carbon efficient than the alternative of manufacturing and deploying a new piece of hardware. So let's talk a little bit about what carbon efficiency means. So when we talk about carbon efficiency, we're not just talking about the total carbon footprint. What we care about is how well we're actually making use of that carbon expenditure. So for this paper, we defined a new metric, which we call computational carbon intensity. And it's simply the ratio of the carbon expenditure over a device or system's entire lifetime to the amount of computational work done throughout that lifetime. 
We can further break the numerator into the carbon from manufacturing and the carbon from use. And as long as we know the carbon intensity of our grid power, the mean power of our system, and our lifetime, we can get a good estimate for the carbon footprint of the use phase. Our definitions of computational work done are going to vary depending on the target application. So what we do is we benchmark a representative application in order to get a rate of work in operations per second, which is again integrated over that lifetime. So this gives us our full formula. And now let's talk about how we can apply it. So we're going to look at three single devices, a new PowerEdge server, an old Nexus 4 smartphone from 2012, and an old Pixel 3a smartphone from 2019. We benchmark each of these devices using the Geekbench benchmarking suite, which is a cross-platform benchmarking suite that has several sub-benchmarks within it. So I pulled out a few representative ones here. And you can see that, of course, the server performs better than the smartphones across all benchmarks, although the rate of slowdown does vary. We also get the mean power of each of these devices. We can get the carbon intensity of our grid power by assuming that we're operating in California and going off of our knowledge of how California energy is sourced. And then for the carbon footprint from manufacturing, on the side of the new server, we source these numbers from Dell. They've published um, these numbers before. And then for the used devices, since we're repurposing them, we don't have to manufacture them. In this case, we set the carbon footprint from manufacturing to zero. So the results look like this. So let's focus first on the SGEM matrix multiply benchmark. On the x-axis, you see the lifetime of the system in months. And then on the y-axis, you see the resulting carbon intensity in milligrams of CO2 per op if that device were deployed for that number of months. And you'll notice that the phones are flat lines, and that's because the carbon from manufacturing is zero, so it works out to a constant. Whereas for the server, as you use it for longer, the initial manufacturing cost is amortized away. However, despite this amortization, both of the old phones do perform better than the new server, even the Nexus 4 from 2012, which is relatively inefficient. It's similar across the other two benchmarks where the phones perform even better. So this is great motivation for the project, but it's also a pretty contrived example. Of course, you're not just going to be running matrix multiply over and over again on a server. So let's talk about what we actually built in order to get a better idea of what a real system might look like. So we've built a prototype cloudlet that consists of 10 Pixel 3 smartphones. We connect them over Wi-Fi since that was pretty easy. At least for now, in the future, we would like to move to wireless or to wired. Um, for the software stack, we replace the Android OS with Ubuntu Touch, which is an open source mobile operating system that provides a more desktop-like experience. It makes development a lot easier, and it also gets around some of those issues related to Android that we mentioned previously. We had to do some further kernel hacking to add back in some modules that had been excised from the Linux kernel for mobile. This allows us to do things like run Docker on the phones. We then deploy microservice-based applications across our cluster. So let's talk about those applications. We benchmark our phone cloudlet using Deathstar Bench, which is an open source microservice-based benchmarking suite. So if you're not familiar with the microservice programming model, I put a diagram up here from the Deathstar paper. And this is just showing you how you can break a large end-to-end -end application, in this case, a social network, into component pieces, which are those modular microservices. Each microservice can be deployed all on the same device or across multiple devices, which makes it a good fit for our smartphone cluster. So we take our 10 phones, we connect them in a Docker swarm over Wi-Fi, and then we deploy these microservice-based applications across the cluster. So this is showing examples from the social network application. So each phone ends up hosting three or four of those microservices. For benchmarking, we connect using an external device, which one runs the workload generator on the same local Wi-Fi network. As a baseline, we compare against several differently sized AWS EC2 instances in the C5 flavor, the C5X, 12XL, 9XL, and 4XL. And in the AWS case, the entire application, so all of the microservices are running on a single machine with a client and a second thread. So there's no network latency or latency between um, nodes. All right, so let's look at the results. On the x-axis here, you have the throughput in terms of the requests per second served by the system. And on the y-axis, you have the tail latency at the bottom and the median latency at the top. So for the social network application with a right heavy workload, the phone-based cluster is able to perform significantly better than the AWS instances studied, at least in terms of the throughput achieved before latency shoots up. However, if you look at the latency for lower throughputs, you'll note that the phone-based cluster is always, always has higher latency than the AWS alternatives, 
And that's due in large part to the latency between those microservice calls since they're on different devices. For the social network application, again, this time with a read heavy workload generator, the phone cluster performs significantly worse. It's somewhere between a 4XL and a 9XL machine. And then for hotel reservation, which has a mixed workload generator with both reads and writes, the phone based cluster is somewhere around the performance of a 9XL. So from this, we said the phone based system is something like a C5 9X large instance. So overall, the phone based cluster was higher latency, but it did scale up well. So depending on the target quality of service guarantees, it may or may not be an acceptable alternative to AWS in this scenario. So revisiting our metrics of success, we've shown that performance is worthwhile depending on your quality of service guarantees. So now let's talk about carbon efficiency. So I'm gonna put our formula back up here. For the AWS C5 instances, it's impossible to get a direct number for how much carbon they take to manufacture since AWS isn't publishing that. However, we went with a third party estimate. For the smartphone cloudlet, we again, consider that the smartphones themselves take zero carbon to manufacture since we're repurposing them, but we do take into account the cost of periodic battery replacements and smart plugs to allow us to toggle power on and off to the devices. For each application, we take the highest throughput before latency shoots up on that graph that I just showed as our rate of work. And we get the mean power for the smartphone cloud lit from benchmarking and for AWS again from estimates. So the results show that across the three applications and workloads studied, um, the carbon efficiency of the phone-based cluster is about 10x that of the AWS alternative. And for the applications that the phones do a little bit better on, for instance, social network write, it's even less carbon intense, but overall still better than the AWS alternative. So we've shown carbon efficiency. Uh, if we return to our vision, what have we accomplished? What haven't we accomplished? So we talked about tens of smartphones. So far, we've built exactly 10. So a big goal is to scale up to maybe something like 500 devices, since that would be the equivalent of about 10 servers. We want to add OS support for more device models. One problem with the Ubuntu Touch OS that we're using right now is that it has support for a limited number of devices. So we're working on porting something that looks like mainline Linux to newer versions of the Pixel, since right now we're working with a Pixel from 2019. In terms of infrastructure, at a 10 phone scale, cooling has not been a problem, and we've been able to use a Wi-Fi network. However, with a larger number of devices, interference would make Wi-Fi infeasible. So this is a big problem to solve as we scale up. So that's all I have, and I'll be happy to take any questions.